In today's tabloid, Bat Boy helps us understand AD&D. Hello everybody, how are you doing today? Hope you're doing well. Hope everyone is fine and safe and the whole deal. And all the rest. My name is Trevor Ursulescu, I'm the owner of Monster Hobbies in High River, Alberta, Canada. And today we begin our second video on the original 1979 Advanced Dungeons and Dragons DM Guide. Now today is going to be quite a big lesson and it's going to be quite an interesting discourse and hopefully you won't get too lost because today our discourse is on dice. Yes, that's right. It's on dice. Now Gary Gygax has put a lot of information into this and I don't know it it's cool because you get to learn exactly how the dice work. You also get a bit of perspective on dice in the 1970s which are pretty rare and experimental. There's only a few companies that were making dice back then and uh, there was a lot of experimentation from sort of one format to another and all the rest. And it's also designed if you only have six-sided dice otherwise known as d6 and not like a set of the polyhedral dice which we have now readily available in all kinds of flavors colors and everything else actually i have some available on our online store www.monster-hobbies.ca i'll leave the link down in the doobly-doo and if you have any comments as this goes through or if you actually understand all this dice theory and everything don't forget to leave it in the blah blah now if you're wondering what that means the doobly-doo is, of course, the video information that I'm sharing to you. And the blah-blah is the comment section, which, of course, is where you put your blah-blah. <laughs> All right, without further ado, let's shake them bones and discover dice. Gary Gygax begins his discourse on dice. Dice. As a DM, the tools of your trade are dice. Platonic, solid-shaped, or just about any other sort. The random numbers you generate by rolling dice determine the results based on the probabilities determined herein or those you have set forth on your own. In case you are not familiar with probability curves, there are two types which are determined by your dice. Linear, straight line, which has equal probability of any given integer in the number group, and Bell, ascending and descending line, which has greater probability toward the center of the group of numbers than at either end. The two curves are illustrated thus. Linear curve. The die number, probability of number appearing in ascending order. Interval between integers, 10%. So from there to there, it's 10% increase. So on a 10-sided dice, if you roll a 1, it is 10. 2 is 20%. 3 is 30%. 4 is 40%, 5 50%, 6 60%, 7 70%, 8 80%, 9 90%, and 10 or 0 is 100%. Linear, linear probability develops a straight line of ascending probability when used as a cumulative probability as shown above. Bell distribution, when used to delineate the probability of certain numbers appearing, develops a curved line like this. Bell curve using 3d6, three six-sided dice. Probability of a given integer appearing a, a percentage, so from 1 to 13. And then down here we've got from 3, because 3 dice, if you roll all 1s, will be a 3. And if you roll all 6s, added together will be 18. So this is how the curve works. So a low chance is rolling a 3, then 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and you see it rises up. And then across here from 9, 10, 11, and 12, there is an averaging right up in here. And then 13 is getting higher, harder to roll, 14, 15, 16, and 17, and 18. So these are very hard to get down here, as are these here. Up and around this is a little more average. Here is the, the basic average that you're going to get between uh, roughly 8 and 12.
A single die or multiple dice read in succession, such as three dice read as hundreds, tens, and decimals, give linear probabilities. Two or more dice added together generate a bell-shaped probability curve. So therefore, that means if you roll three dice and you say the first one is going to be the hundreds, the second one is going to be the tens place, and the third is just going to be the regular decimal numbers from one to nine, then if you roll those dice, it would give you like 326 or something like that, which is a linear probability. Two or more dice added together, so two dice added together making seven, would generate a bell-shaped probability curve. Before any discussion takes place, let us define the accepted abbreviations for the various dice. A die is symbolized by D, and its number of sides is shown immediately thereafter. A six-sided dice is therefore D6. D8 is an eight-sided die, and so on. Two four-sided dice are expressed by 2D4. Five eight-sided dice are 5D8, etc. Any additions to or subtra subtractions from the die or dice are expressed after the identification. Thus, D8 plus 8 means a linear number grouping between 9 and 16, while 3D6 minus 2 means a bell-shaped progression from 1 to 16, with the greatest probability group in the middle, 8 and 9. This latter progression has the same median numbers as 2D6, but it has higher and lower ends and a greater probability of a median number than if 2D12 were used. When percentage dice are to be used, this is indicated by D%. Percent. The D4 can be used to generate 25% incremental probabilities. Random numbers from 1 to 4 with plus 1, it generates a linear 2 to 5, etc. It can be used to get 1 or 2, 1 or 2 equals 1, 3 or 4 equals 2, in conjunction with any other dice to get linear or bell-shaped probability curves. For example, 2d4 equals a range of 2 to 8, 3d4 equals a range of 3 to 12, uh, d4 plus d6 equals a range of 2 to 10, d4 plus d20, as in uh, t d10, because some of the old dice had two d10s as a d20, single unit, equals 2 to 14. When rolled in conjunction with another die, the d4 can be used to determine linear number ranges twice that shown on the other, si uh, on the other die. Thus, d4 reading 1 or 2 means that whatever is read on the other die is the number shown. But if the d4 reads 3 or 4, add the highest number on the second die to the number shown. So if a d8 is the second die, 1 to 16 can be generated. If a d12 is used, 1 to 24 can be generated. Uh, if a d20 is used either 1 to 20, assuming the use of a standard d20, which is numbered 0 to 9 twice without coloring one set of faces to indicate that one set of faces is colored, can be gotten by adding 0 if 1 or 2 is rolled on the d4 and 10 or 20 depending on the die type if a 3 or 4 is rolled. Linear series above this are possible simply by varying the meaning of the d4 number. 1 always means add 0, but 2 can be interpreted as adds the value highest number of the second die. 3 can be twice value and 4 can be thrice value. Thus, a d4 reading 4 in conjunction with a d8 linear curve 1 to 32 would mean 24 plus d8 or 25 to 32. So just to get a better sense of what Gary is saying here, I have a d4. So what he is saying is that if it's a 1, that is 25%. If it's a 2, that's going to be 50%. A 3 would be 75%. And then a 4 would be 100%. Now the value number range of this dice is 1 to 4, of course, having 4 sides. So when you roll this dice, no matter what the result would be, like here it is a 3, it will be a 3. Now what Gary is saying is if you start adding 1 to that, this range now goes from 1 to 4, now to 2 to 5. So you essentially shift 
this dice up a point value by one. And if it was 1d4 plus 2, then your lowest number is going to be 2, your highest number is going to be 6, and so on and so on. Now if you have two four-sided dice, your range of course is going to now be from 1 to 8. Because when you roll these two together and add them up, that is the bell curve you are now creating. So next up, Gary is telling us that we can increase our range of other dice by using the d4 in a different way, instead of rolling these two together and ending up with a total of a range between 2 to 10. We can instead use the d4 to uh, use as a doubling dice on the secondary dice we're using. So what we have here is, if we roll a 1 or a 2 on the d4, then this dice range is normal. So if, let's just say I rolled a 1 and I got a 5, so our number would be 5 because this one is being counted as not being there. But if I instead rolled a 3 or a 4, what I would do here is say, okay, this is a six-sided dice, so whatever this value is, because the 4 is a 3 or a 4, it will add the highest number on this dice to this dice. Thus, I just rolled an 11 if this one came up as a 3 or a 4. The same can be said if you're using other dice. So, for example, this d8. If I roll this and I got an 8, and this one I rolled ended up as a 1, this value would be an 8. But if I got the 3 or 4, this value would now become 16. 8 plus 8, the highest number on this dice. Same can be said with our d12, so this one will become 14. And the same with our d10, so this value here would now become 14. What Gary is saying next might be a little bit confusing to us in our day, but back in the 70s, you had a lot of these d20s that were actually double d10s made into a 20-sided object. So, for example, I don't know how... Oh, you can see it. Yeah, There's a zero on there. And then if we rotate this around, there's another zero over here. Now what they used to do is they would color an edge or something, or make the numbers a different color on these dice, so that when you rolled it, you would either know that if uh, what you rolled was either a 1 or an 11. But what Gary is saying here is that you would take your, your double D20, or double D10, I guess, and you would either... You, not use these or use the three or four to double up whatever number that was. Now, he's also saying you can use a regular d20 and do the same thing. So here you could roll this d20, end up with a 14, and if it was a one or a two it would be a 14, but if it was a three or a four it would be 34 because you're taking your 20 and you're adding that 14 to it. What applies to D4 has similar application with regard to D6, D8, D12, and D20. The D6 has a 16 and 2 thirds intervals, D8 has 12 and a half intervals, and D20 can have 10% or 5% intervals. The 10% uh, intervals would be the double D20, D10 as a D20, or 5% intervals as a regular D20. A d6 is useful for getting a random number from 1 to 3. 1 to 2 equals 1, 3 to 4 equals 2, and 5 to 6 equals 3, while 1 to 5 can be easily read from a d20. 1 to 2 equals 1, 3 to 4 equals 2, 5 to 6 equals 3, 7 to 8 equals 4, and 9 to 0 equals 5. The d20 is used often both as d10 and d20. The bell-shaped probability curves typically range from 2 to 20 to 5 to 50, i.e. 2, 3, 4, or 5 d20 added together. Also common is the reading as above with one decimal place added to the result to get two, or 20 to 200, 30 to 300, etc. In the latter case, roll a roll of 3 on 1 die and 0, read as 10, totals 13 plus 1 place, or 130. Non-platonic solid-shaped dice are available in some places. The most common of these is a 10-sided die, which we have here, numbering from 0 to 9, which is there. 
As with the D20, this can be used for many purposes, even replacing the D20, the double D10 D20, if a second die is used in conjunction to get 5% interval curves, 1 to 20. Also, the die can give 0 to 9 linear curve random numbers as the D20 can. Other dice available are various forms of averaging dice. The most common of these has six faces which read 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5. The median of the curve it generates is still 3.5, that of a normal d6, but the low and high numbers 2 and 5 are only half as likely to appear as 3 or 4. There is a 33 and a third chance for either of the two latter numbers to be rolled, so the probabilities of absolutely averaging rolls are far greater. Other such dice have zeros on them, several low numbers, and so on. These sort of dice, along with poker dice, put and take dice, or any other sort, can be added in order to give you more flexibility or changing probabilities in random selection or even interpretation. For example, the author has a d6 with the following faces, spade, club, club, diamond, diamond, heart. If during an encounter players meet a character whose reaction is uncertain, the card suit die is rolled in conjunction with 3d6. Black suit means dislike, with the spade equaling hate, while red equals like, the heart being great favor. The d, uh, the, pardon me, the 3d6 give a bell-shaped probability curve of 3 to 18, with 9 to 12 being the mean spread. Spade 18 means absolute and unchangeable hate, while heart 8 indicates the opposite. Clubs or diamonds can be altered by discourse, rewards, etc. Thus clubs 12 could possibly be altered to clubs 3 by offer of a tribute or favor. Clubs 3 change to diamonds 3 by a gift, etc. In closing this discussion, simply keep in mind that the dice are your tools. Learn to use them properly and they will serve you well. Now to help us along in our discussion, I made this chart here on graph paper using a d20 with the percentages as it would be appearing on the faces of the d20. So for a 1 we get 5%, uh, 2, wherever that is, would give us 10%, a 3 is 15%, and on and on. So I'll just move this over to the side here, or it's casting a shadow on our chart. So from here I've numbered from 1 to 20, and down here I've added in the percentages. Could also go the other way around, doesn't really matter. So if you roll a 1, that is your 5% chance of doing something. You could also do this the other way, count down from the top. So you would need to roll a 19 if you needed a 5% chance. So if you're an unskilled um, fighter and you need to open a lock, and you don't have any skills in that, it may say you can get it on a 5%. So that would mean you would have to take this dice, and to succeed you need to roll a 19. Well, there's a 12, so we failed that. Now it could also say you get a plus 5% to whatever for doing something. So we roll the d20 again. Oops. Well, up oh, there. Let's say I got a 13. So another 5% would actually move this up to a 14. So that would improve your success modifier on one of these things, depending on what it is that you were doing. So here we've got a 5%, so you would either need to hit a 1 or a 19, depending on if you want to go from the bottom up or the top down. Here you would need to roll a 2 for 10%, 3 for 15%, 4 for 20%, or conversely, this would be 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, on and on, until over here, to get a 100%, you would roll a 20. So that's why in later games they had the critical roll was a uh, getting a 20. So if you roll a 20 unmodified, then that means you hit 100%. Now, there's a, another thing known as a dirty D20, or a dirty 20, which is, let's say you rolled 18, but you had a modifier which gave you the 10%, so now you flip this up two faces to get to your 20. So that would be a dirty 20, but a natural 20 would be, of course, rolling perfect 20. 
and that's what we all want to attain to. But if you remember that bell curve, this is a really slim chance to get a 20. And on the bell curve, these numbers would be somewhere up in here. But this is a linear sort of uh, chart. If I were to take a line and go right between all these points, you get a linear line going up there. But I made this just to understand the dice rolls a bit better. So if it says you've got a 10% chance of getting this thing, then that means you would get it if you rolled an 18 or a 2, you know, depending on how to do it. Most players don't really want to roll to aim low. <laughs> so you can't go, okay, you can open this door if you get a 1. You know, the, the guy's going to be like, well, what if I get a 2 or a 3? Do I still open the door? No, only a 1. Well, that seems weird, right? So it's better to, to understand what they're talking about with the percentages and then reverse it. So you need a 19 to open the lock if you got a 5% chance of doing it. Or you need a, well, what's an easier number? 70. So that would be right there. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 from 20 is 14. So let's see if I can do whatever that is. Nope, I got a 5. See what I mean? But if you go the other way around and you say, oh, you need a you know, that reverse number, then people are like, well, I got a five. Should I, I should be able to open that. Well, no, you needed something else. You know what I'm saying? So this is just to convert what Gary is saying or what they're saying in the Dungeons and Dragons books, because Gary might not have done everything, right? Especially if you get a module, he didn't write every single module. But whoever wrote it would say, you've got a 60% 60, 60 chance of falling down the stairs right so that would mean oh yeah so if you're falling down the stairs okay 60 percent chance that's where you do want them well of course to roll high so anything lower like 12 i might have fallen down the stairs so let's see one two three four five six seven eight eight from 20 is 12. I just made it. I just made it with a 60% chance. So you see, making something like this up for yourself will help you when you're playing AD&D. So how do all these dice values look when you're actually going to play Dungeons & Dragons? Well, here we have a nice little creature from the old Fiend Folio, which was a sort of a British Dungeons & Dragons compendium piece to the Monster Manual. Had all these monsters made in England, London, and whatnot. So here we have the street screaming devilkin, which he kind of reminds me of the old bat boy from the tabloids. Remember back in the 80s and 90s, you'd see this picture of this little baby face bat guy, and it would say something like, Bat boy rescues children from a burning building, or bat boy is a new referee for the LA Lakers, or, you know, something weird like that, right? Anyway. So here we can see the monster stats. Now, I'm not going to get too much into this because, of course, we want to do that in a Monster Manual video coming up in the future sometime. So here we have a frequency. He's rare. And according to the Monster Manual, rare indicates a 11% chance of seeing this creature in a dungeon. So that's more for the Dungeon Master, of course. The number of these guys appearing is between 1 and 4. So when you're setting this up in the game, you can roll your four-sided dice. And there, if you can see it, I rolled a four. So there will be four in this layer. Armor class is two, which is the equivalent for this thing to wear plate mail and a shield if you were to come up against it. So as you can see, this doesn't really have plate mail and shield, but I would guess that it has a pretty tough hide. And because it's flying, it would be hard to hit. Also, because it is a small creature, as it says on here, size small. It's only three feet tall or less. So that's why they gave it the armor class rating of two. Movement is 12, and if you, uh, well, when you see the figure video, you'll see what that means. The number of hit dice. Now, according to the monster manual in this book, each monster has a hit dice of 1d8 value. So this one has three hit dice. So our little guy here will have six, seven, eight, nine hit dice. So he's going to be uh, able to take nine damage before he dies, of course. 
Now, percentage in layer is 20%. Now, what this means is a layer in layer indicates a chance of encountering the monster in question where it domiciles and stores its treasure, if any. If a monster encountered is not in its layer, it will not have any treasure unless it carries individual treasure or some form of magic. Whether or not a, an encounter is occurring in the monster's lair might be totally unknown to the person or persons involved until after the outcome of the encounter is resolved. So, 20% chance. So again, that would be, um, it would be a roll of 18 and up, or 1 to 2 on a 20-sided dice. The treasure type is M, which ends up being three to eight, or sorry, two to eight gold coins. So that, of course, would be two, two D four, because it's a value of two to eight. So if I just roll these, our little creature here is going to have five gold coins in his lair if you encounter him in the lair. Now, if you encounter him somewhere else in the dungeon, he's not going to have those coins around. Uh, number of attacks is one, so in each combat he only gets one, but his damage is one dash six, which is a six sided dice. So this little guy, each time he hits you, does two damage. So then we get into special attacks and magic resistance and all the rest of this stuff, but we won't really cover that until we look in the monster manual. But that is basically how these are going. So as you see back in the day, it just had one dash four. Nowadays, if this was in a new monster manual, it would probably say 1d4, and then damage would be 1d6 instead of 1-6. So that's how it's changed between the uh, two systems. Well, I guess actually four more systems, because this is first edition, and then now we have second, third, fourth, and fifth came out. So quite a bit of time away. Now I'm going to show you some other little bits here. So here we have a chart from the first place award-winning module, Citadel by the Sea, from the Dragon Magazine, October 1983, issue number 78. And this table is in reference to the random encounter creatures you're going to meet, because at some point you have to go from the town to the Citadel. And there's four ways to go over to the Citadel. One is on clear terrain, the other is through the hills, the third is through the forests, and the fourth is along the coastline. And so they have four different types of encounters you could have there for each of these different terrain areas. So for example, you would start, let's say they went through the clear terrain. So you're going to roll your d4, and we find that the value here is 4. So they meet one giant skunk, which is pretty obvious because it's a 1. Here we have one to three wild boars. So what that would be is you take your D6 and you essentially divide it by two. So one and two equals one, two and or one and two equals one, three and four equal two, and five and six equal three. So that's pretty easy to figure out. Here we have two to five hunters. So that is basically a one D4 plus one. So your one value becomes two. Your 2 becomes 3, your 3 becomes 4, your 4 becomes 5, so that takes care of that. And then here we have 3 to 6 wild dogs. So this again is the D6, but kind of done in a different way. So a 1 and 2 would equal the 3 wild dogs. A 3 and 4 would equal 4. And then a 5 and 6 would equal 6. Somehow I don't have that right. <laughs> See what I mean? This is what made it tough back in the day to really figure out what is this? Oh, uh, no, never mind. This is a 1d4 plus 2. Think about it for a second here. We've got a 1 plus 2 is 3. A 2 plus 3 is 4. Or, uh, sorry, 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 plus 3 is 5. And 2 plus 4 gives you the 6. So that's a 1d4 plus 2. See, it's simple, but at the same time, it's complex because you're looking at these numbers and they just don't register in your brain right off the, like that, you know? You got to stop and think, 3 to 6, 3 to 6, what does that mean? Three to six? Oh, yeah. Okay, one, and then you're looking at your dice. You're like, 
Can't be a D6. Doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? And here we have like forest. 1D4 wild dogs. So that's a... Or sorry, 1 to 4 wild dogs. So that's a D4. 1 to 2 black bears. So that's a D4 divided by 2. Or it could also be a D6 divided by 3. Or it could be... Yeah, so values 1, 2, and 3 equals 1 black bear. Or 3, 4... Or 4, 5, and 6, pardon me, is 2 black bears. 3 to 6 hunters. You know, this sort of thing. And you're all trying to constantly figure this out. 2 to 8 giant rats would be 2D4. Well, 3 to 6 hunters, we already did that with the wild dogs. You know, all this kind of stuff. So coastline, 2 two to 12 barracuda, so that's 2D6. 1 to 2 crabmen, that's a D3 divided by 4. Uh, sorry, uh, D4 divided by 2. 1 to 3 fishing boats is our D6 divided by 2. And 3 to 30 quippers is 3D10. So you can see how this, like, just trying to figure this out, you need to plan it all ahead of time. Whereas in the new books, it would say, of course, 3D30, or, sorry, it would say 3D10 quippers, you know, 2D4 giant rats, you know, this sort of thing. So they have simplified this in further editions, but of course, this is how this all works out. And to further add to all these kinds of roles, here we have a character called Serga Olmus. He's a half-orc of 4th level cleric and 4th level assassin, so he's double class, or multi-class, pardon me, strength 17, plus 1, plus 1. Okay, anyway, constitution and all that stuff. So it says thief abilities, pickpocket, 30%. So I was reading a little more on this, and the 30%, it goes from the bottom up. So in order to pickpocket, you have to roll between 1 and 6 on a d20. I think it's 6 anyway. Open locks, 34%. Find and remove traps, 30%. Or actually, you'd roll your percentile die. So if you get 30% or less, you've actually picked the pocket. If you get 31%, you fail. Open locks, 34%. On a 35% or higher, you fail. You know, so again, there's all these kinds of <laughs> ways that all these percentages and whatnot were in the original edition, where now it would be simplified down to basing it all off of the d20. So that concludes Gary Gygax's discourse on dice, with, of course, my explanations involved. And so I thought just for fun I would show you guys my collection of dice. Now this was the first set of dice that I ever bought going back into the 1980s. Uh, and what I have here is, of course, all white dice. This is a d4. Of course, our d6. Now I never got the number ones, but I, of course, these were common everywhere. Still are today. So I've got this regular white six-sided dice with the holes in it. There's our D8, our D10, a D12, which always reminds me of a soccer ball, a D20. This is one that you really don't see, and I've never really used. I, I bought it thinking I could use it, but it's very hard to find a game that uses this thing. There are some 1 to 30 type uh, things for Dungeons & Dragons, and this, of course, makes rolling that a bit easier. But, as you can see, this one's a, the nicest of them all. I barely used it. It's 30-sided dice. And then this funny one here, with the double zeros, is a percentile die. And you would use that in conjunction with your d10. So this one, of course, is your top numbers. So if I just turn this, you can see there it says 30, or 90, or whatever. So just clearing these out of the way to find out a percentage, you can go like this. So we have 77%. So on some of those things in the old Dungeon Master Guide and whatnot that say you need 77%, you could do it this way instead of trying to do it on a d20 or some other scale like that. This one will give you, of course, your 10s and your 1 places. So that's why these are used. So back in the 70s, there was many companies that made dice. And most of the dice were made out of a really soft plastic, like my white set here. And as you can see, the corners would round down a little bit. The D12 is quite large, same size as D20. And these dice had a tendency, I don't know how well you can see this, to chip on the corners and along the edges. And uh, that was not really good 
the more you play Dungeons & Dragons. However, back in the day, a company called Game Science came out with these dice down below, which we used to sell at the store until I sold out of them. But these are made out of the same plastic as motorcycle helmets, and they don't chip. And in fact, the edges stayed really sharp all throughout all this time. And here you can also see that the D12 is smaller than this D12, and that is because these faces are... Um, oh, how is it described to me? <laughs> it's They're more mathematically angular or whatever that they need to be to land properly than these faces were. And then, of course, the D20. You can see how sharp these are. They're like laser sharp edges, razor sharp edges, I guess. And uh, that's what made the game science dice last longer and perform better than our regular dice. These dice here come from the Star Trek the role-playing game, which is another game that I want to cover in our video channel here. These dice are those double D10s, and for whatever reason this one is in good shape and this one has the corners all rubbed off even though they both came from the same set, so I'm not sure what was going on here. But it was very typical in the 70s that the dice were not made of very good plastic materials, so I assume this is what the problem is. So these, of course, have the 1 to 0 on one side and 1 to 0 on the other side, which are different from our modern D20s. Now next up I have these neat little glitter dice. These are miniaturized versions of all our polyhedral dices. So here we have a D4, two D6s, a D8, a D10, a D12, a D20, believe it or not, and a percentile die. Now just to sort of get the idea of how small these are, here's our regular D20 right here. <laughs> and you can see quite the size comparison difference. So I guess you could use these on a little road trip if you really need to play D&D badly and you don't have any room to pack the extra bigger dice? I don't know. I've never really used them, but I do like them because they're cute. Now, if you need dice for your gaming adventure, we do carry a set of Chessex dice online at our hobby shop in various different colors and whatnot, and I'll leave a link to those down in the doobly-doo. Now, these funny six-sided dice are actually Dungeon Master dungeon building dice. And, of course, we have one here, which is for making your dungeon, and the other one for putting magical items and whatnot in your dungeon. So I'm just going to turn these. So here we have stairs. These kind of rubbed off a little bit. They could either be up or down. Okay, and then if we turn this over, you've got a door. Here is a T section for a tunnel. Not sure what the little C on there was all about. This could be a right hand, or actually it should go this way. So we have a left hand turn. Okay, and then we turn it this way. You got a passage going straight ahead. And the final one should be, of course, a right hand turn. So let's say you needed to make a dungeon, so you're, you've got your grid paper down. Okay, and you can say, okay, I need to start here in the center. So we've got a room with a door. So the first thing, when you get through the door, you get into a T section. So you want to do like, here's your room. Okay, you've got your entranceway was there, and there's a door here. And now we go into this T section, so maybe you could even go, how far down is it? So let's use our D10. So we've got, let's say, five feet. So each square represents uh, 10, or 50 feet, let's say. So one, two, three, four, five. So we go down five, and then we're going to have our T in here. See, and then as you roll this thing, you roll out more whichevers, and on you go. And here we have our treasure dice. So for this one, we have an axe some gold coins, a scroll or a spell, a weapon, and then on this face we have a shield, and a diamond. So if you need treasure, you can't think of what to throw in there, you just roll this dice and you're like, oh, in this room is a magic axe, or 
you know, there's a shield or something like that. So that one in conjunction with our dungeon are great for making dungeons. And here we have the most important dice of the game. These, of course, are the pizza dice. Yeah, I actually picked these up. So you roll these in conjunction to figure out what kind of pizza you want to have for the night of when you're playing Dungeons and Dragons with all your friends. So here we've got green peppers, got onions, pineapple, olives, mushrooms, and the extra ingredient. And on this side you have sausage, extra cheese, pepperoni, hamburger, ham, uh, bacon, and is that it? Extra cheese. <laughs> so I feel like it's lunchtime, so let's figure out what we got. We have a mushroom pepperoni pizza. Hooray! <laughs> there you go. Well, I hope you enjoyed that great video on dice. I mean, it was quite enlightening. And I didn't even know some of those dice actually existed. Did you know about the poker dice and all the rest? I mean, that's pretty neat. Like, where would you find that now? Oh, well, maybe in, like, gambling games? I don't know. <laughs> I never looked for them before. But anyway, if you understood all of that, please let us know down in the blah blah. And, uh, what else can I say? But may Nuffle grant you healthy rolls. Until next time, Hopefully all your rolls will become natural 20s. And have a great game.